Um, the future is already here. It's just not very well distributed. David Yoakum here. A few weeks ago, there was a blackout in New York City, and it caused all sorts of problems. Traffic and subway gridlock, people trapped in elevators, no working appliances or computers. It's really a window into what our world would look like if there wasn't abundant electricity everywhere. So today we've invited in Mackie McCleary to talk about how the electric grid really works and what it's going to look like over the next 5, 10, 50 years. Mackie was until recently the administrator of Rhode Island's Division of Public Utilities and Carriers. He's currently a partner at Energy Consulting and a senior fellow here at the Policy Lab. The conversation is electric. Welcome to 30,000 Leagues. Well, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I want to start getting you on the record that you enjoy brutalism. Yes. You must defend yourself, sir. I wouldn't call it enjoy. I would say appreciate is the correct term. Brutalism is by nature brutal. Yeah. And in many cases, the buildings will actually hurt you if you lean against them. So it's hard to say enjoy. I, what I would say is I deeply appreciate the style as a pure condensation of a particular age, uh, which is really what architecture is. How would you describe brutalism? Put a, put a picture in folks' mind who haven't seen it before. Yeah, they're giant concrete bunkers that people live in. Uh, and the that's the way they appear on the outside. And they were built during a time of Cold War history where the entire world lived in fear of nuclear apocalypse. And the architectural style at the time was to essentially create buildings that looked like nuclear bunkers. The interesting thing about them is that they are terrifying to look at from the outside. But experiencing them from the inside is otherworldly. They, have, they are floor-to-ceiling windows. They're gorgeous works of modernism. And so there's just something beautiful and complicated about them. And in so many ways, it's such a simple, like I said, a condensation of a zeitgeist at a particular time, more so than almost any other architectural style that I can think of. Um, you know exactly what they mean uh, when they're talking about brutalism. It is what it is. So... Obviously, we're getting in this because you have an architectural background. Yeah. Why did you go to architecture school? Whew, that's interesting. Why did I go to architecture school? I went to architecture school because I like imagining the world and making it. And I always have. Um, I started out writing poems and designing planes when I was a little kid. But I've always been very interested in the future. Um, not as a thing that will happen to me, but as a thing that is makeable. And architecture was, the, I remember the first, still remember the first time I sat in an art history class and uh, Professor Vincent Scully, who I ended up late, later, later TAing his class um, at Yale, he put up a slide comparison of a sort of colonial staircase and uh, this beautiful piece of art deco by Victor Orta, if I remember correctly. He was a Belgian architect. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, I, I would like to do that. So I want to ask, a big question and even just ask your help in how to start to unpack it, which is, let's let you be Professor Mackey for the moment. I want sort of a 101 on how our utility grid works. Yeah. Who manages it? We're, we're, what's the, how should we even begin to describe this? It's a fun, so I would say the, the shortest answer is it's probably easier to just assume it's tiny wizards. It's extremely complicated. And it's more fun to think of it as magic because I always go back to that quote of uh, as any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I think it was Carl Sagan, maybe? Carl Sagan or Isaac Asimov is one of the sci-fi writers. I don't remember who said it. Um, but even though the grid itself was designed as essentially an operating entity in the early 20th century, it is still nearly indistinguishable from magic. And that's what I mean by it being wondrous and worthy of, of wonder. Um, so the way I would describe it is, an, a one real simple way to think about electricity is that you could take out electrons. Don't think about it as electricity, think about it as water. And what I mean by that is essentially the way our system is designed, um, electricity is produced essentially at the top of a hill and it flows downhill from the generation point through transmission cables, which are the big ones that look like um, the Leonardo da Vinci thing with the man hit, sticking his hands out, the giant ones that are 40 feet tall. Those are transmission cables at very high voltage. They move electrons a very far distance. Um, and then it gets, you know, it goes to a substation and gets essentially into a slightly smaller tributary and moves further down the hill to the distribution grid. That's the ones that you recognize on the poles. Um, and then it goes 
past your house into your home, if you think about it as a river in that sense. Um, and then once it's in your home, you, you use it to power all your devices the same way you, you do with your water system. Most water systems also run downhill. So think about it uh, from a commodity point of view, like water, it's basically you produce the way it was originally designed, you produce all the power at the top of the hill and it runs downhill and you try to maximize the efficiency. A couple of other important points are, and this is the one that really boggles people's minds, at any given moment in the US and frankly in every power system in the world, the exact amount of energy being produced matches the exact amount of energy being consumed. So all 5 billion of us are doing things that consume energy and the electricity grid operator's responsibility is to make sure that exactly that amount is being produced and little to no more because we don't really have any ability to store energy in the grid. So the only way you can manage it is by having essentially this complicated dance that one has to do on the head of a pin in order to keep all the lights on all the time. Uh, and so the challenge, uh, people take this for granted that the lights are always on, but when you actually, the more you understand about the engineering of that system, the more amazing and frankly terrifying it is that the lights are on all the time. You think about the extent of huge human ingenuity that's necessary to do that, it's amazing. So a couple other interesting points. So every single turbine in the system as it was originally designed rotates at exactly the same RPM. So all of the power in the United States is at what we call 60 Hertz, which means that every single turbine is rotating at 3,600 RPM all the time. So never 3,700, never 3,615, 3,600 RPM. Um, that's what gives you power quality. And in Europe, it's at 50 Hertz, which is 3,000 RPM. So that's why if you take your shaver um, which uh, to Europe and you plug it in, it will make a really weird sound and possibly try to kill you which happened to me, yeah, I was in Germany in April and I forgot about it and I just bought a little converter and this is, this is someone who knows the power system. I plugged it in and I made a very terrifying sound and I think, I'm sure the person in the hotel room next to me was like, what is that guy doing? Why does he have a chainsaw? It's because the shaver's it just this, pulling, trying to pull more electricity exactly. in the system it, it, it to give it. it. It was designed to run at 60 hertz and I plugged it into a 50 hertz uh, machine. <laughs> it was very strange. It's a clean shave. Uh, it was a dangerous. <laughs> I would never have put it anywhere near me when I started making that sound. Um, so those are some of the key things to think about it. What I would say is I think that that was how the system was originally designed. Think about that as what Thomas Edison would recognize. The challenge is, is that that system where all the water flows downhill is no longer true. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about this idea of renewable energy. One of the things about renewable energy and particularly distributed renewable energy is that now you've got essentially generators at the bottom of the hill pushing water back up the hill to the grid, uh, which the grid was not designed to do. <laughs> and so there's a lot of changes that need to occur in order to allow those free, uh, sorry, not free, but um, those resources that don't pay for fuel to properly integrate with the, degree, with the grid that was designed in the old way. And so to pivot into that, maybe just a little bit more one-on-one, -on -one, where are, what, what are the energy sources that are putting those electrons at the top of the mountain? Yeah. Um, so up until uh, very recently in the U.S., the largest one was coal. Um, you basically, actually, one way to think about it is it's mostly lighting stuff on fire. Then you've got a few that are just basic turbines moving, uh, like hydroelectric, um, but most of it is different forms of explosions. Um, so you heat up coal and you make steam. You set natural gas on fire, you explode it in a jet engine. Um, you do oil the same way in a big turbine. It's mostly um, condensed versions of carbon intense fuels that are set on fire to heat up water and spin a turbine at exactly 3,600 RPM. Over time, the mix has changed in the US from being coal and nuclear centric um, to being now natural gas centric. So natural gas being as cheap as it is here is the primary source of energy. And um, now actually just two weeks ago, I saw that renewables um, replaced coal as number two or I've forgotten exactly, especially when you include nuclear as a, a non-carbon intense fuel that renewables passed the coal in the mix for the entire U US, which was a big deal. Uh, although not surprising, I think one of the interesting things about the change in, in mix is that I think you hear a lot of political conversation about how it's driven by regulation and other things in terms of coal going away. That's totally false. It's actually the most perfect market mechanism. Coal was destroyed by natural gas. Natural gas is extremely cheap 
and is much cheaper to run and those systems are much easier to start and stop and interact better with uh, renewable energy. So it's a fundamentally better business proposition, which is why the coal generating plants have mostly gone offline uh, in the Northeast and elsewhere. And they're starting to go offline in other places just because it's really hard for coal to compete. And so going back to that top of the mountain then, whether it's coal, natural grass, or nuclear, it's all spinning turbines. And are you leading to a point where you're about to say for renewables, which I'm yeah. We're, we're talking wind. We're talking yeah. One of the, solar. They're doing something other than turning yeah, turbines. Yeah. Well, no. Uh, so wind still spins a turbine, but not at the same degree of RPM. So it's basically a, it's a naturally spinning turbine, and so that's one of the big challenges. You have a power quality issue. You have to have all kinds of things to essentially gas uh, juice up the renewables or alter there to move them onto a DC or an AC system, alternating current. And so on top of the fact that the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So there's a concept called base load, which is essentially, if you think about the load, load is what we call um, the amount of supply into the system, the amount of energy supply, how much is being generated. And a load curve looks like a mountain. It's actually super useful for the uh, analogy. It's got a big base, and in the base, typically you have big, slow energy. So that is hydro, nuclear, coal, that takes a long time to turn on, it takes a long time to turn off. Um, and so that's why you wanna keep them in the base. So that is what keeps the lights on for you, where you don't have variable demand. You know the, the bottom of your demand is never gonna go below, go below that base load. Then you've got a layer on top of that that's somewhat variable load, which is typically now natural gas, and that part's getting bigger. And natural gas plants, especially the newer ones, are what they call both black start and fast start, which means that you can turn them on in five minutes or less. And that's a big deal when you're trying to kind of offset renewables that, that shut down quickly for a grid operator. Uh, and then on top of that, you've got both your more intermittent sources. And then when your energy peak comes in, your super dirty, super expensive plants that never otherwise run unless there's such a big peak that none of your more reasonably priced generating assets can, can fill the need. And that's what we call dirty peakers. And so renewables are to some extent starting to push those out as well, just because um, the more extensive the reliable renewables are, especially things like offshore wind, the less you need a big dirty oil plant that's, you know, in some cases these dirty peakers, I remember we had some 707, I don't know if anyone, you know anything about planes, but the Boeing 707 was um, an airliner from like the 60s, I think, early 60s, one of the first real jetliners. We had one plant in Connecticut that had those, we had one that had F-104 Starfighter engines, which neither were those planes were decommissioned before both you and I were born and they still have the jet engines running some peaker plants all over the, the country. Um, and so you can kind of imagine how inefficient those plants are and the way that the system works, they only get turned on when the market value of energy is so high that it makes sense to run them. The benefit is that yes, they're not running all the time. So from the environmental point of view, that's better. But at the same time, it'd be better if you didn't have to use them at all from an environmental point of view. So the, to the extent that the, that system alters and we're able to take better advantage of renewables, especially when you start to include energy storage, so battery storage as a fast acting uh, renewable response to, uh, tool, well, the overall cost of energy will also start to decrease, which will be good. Are there renewables other than wind and solar? Yeah, there's lots. There's tidal. Um, some would argue that hydro is a renewable. Um, some would say that it's not. Some argue that nuclear is clean-ish, but not renewable because it's carbon-free. Um, so it depends on what your prioritization tools are. Um, some also argue that forms of, so there's a thing called a sewage digester, which is basically uh, waste with bacteria, <laughs> and it creates uh, methane gas. Um, and that methane is then used to run a turbine. And so there are all kinds of different types of renewables. The scale, the ones that have real scale are onshore and offshore wind and solar, though. Dumb question. Wind. Mm -hmm. If you're, I'm not even, I can't even ask it in a non-dumb way. So I'll just stumble <laughs> into it. Like, there's some sense in which it feels like if you're taking advantage of pressure changes and wind. Yeah. Does it actually alter the atmosphere in any way? <laughs> like, is there any Good question? Uh, no. Short answer is no. It does not. Although there is an interesting, uh, many people say that most forms of energy are actually solar energy. 
that maybe the only real one that's not is nuclear and maybe hydro, depending on how you think about why water moves. But essentially coal, oil, and natural gas are all form, well, coal and oil in particular are condensed forms of solar energy because they're made out of plant and animal material. And wind is basically, we have wind because the sun heats different parts of the atmosphere at different ways. So it's essentially also a conversion of solar energy. So basically we are all running on a really big fusion plant in the sky that is producing a prodigious amount of energy of which we only use a tiny, 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 tiny part. Okay. So maybe my question wasn't, do you get, have you get asked that before? No, but I've, I've seen that. I mean, I think there's a whole online community of people who believe that wind actually alters weather, the wind, wind power alters weather and like all kinds of other weird things. Like I, I think the president even said he thought wind power caused cancer. Oh, well, inane. I didn't ask that. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> It's all relative. (laughs) There you go. So if you have a grid that's built for natural gas, coal, nuclear, hydro, it's turning that turbine on the top of the mountain, pushing those electrons down, and it's got the tiny wizard dance on the paw pen to make sure it's always using just what it's generating. Now you throw in solar, wind, and a storage need. Yeah. How is the grid sort of able to absorb this? What needs to change as we move forward? Well, well I mean, what I'd say is I think that's the role of regulators. Uh, the, the job of the regulator is to kind of to see the necessary alterations in the market for the future and then make them possible. Um, so what needs to change? The simple answer is the grid needs to get a lot smarter. Um, so one of the challenges with the old grid is it is basically an analog grid. There's no information that reaches the utility from the edge of the grid where your house is. So uh, to this day, in most cases, the utilities find out that your power is out when you call them, not because they have a sensor at the edge of the grid. I can't tell you how many angry citizens I've had to talk down off the ledge when they found that out because I think it's absurd uh, in the modern technological world that you have to call the utility in order to tell them that your power is out. And uh, so I think there is a large amount of technology that needs to be infused. So think about it as the grid is going to become, it's becoming two ways in terms of power. So in terms of electrons, instead of going only one way downhill, they come both downhill and uphill. But at the same time, in order to allow that, there is a whole new channel of photons, which is information um, that needs to pass back and forth uphill and downhill so that the grid operator and the home, which has its own intelligent systems, can communicate with one another and those machines can talk to the other machines. And that's really the way in which the grid will be able to I- integrate uh, high degrees of renewable penetration. How much of this is actually building new like wires? Almost none. Uh, at least in Rhode Island, we have a bunch of fiber in the ground already. Um, the copper already exists. It's mostly putting sensors on things that already exist and allowing those sensors to talk to one another. Where do the sensors need to be? Everywhere. Most importantly, at the edge of the grid, but also throughout the grid in terms of grid automation. I mean, think about it as think about it sort of like your car. If you took a car from the car I had in high school, it I think maybe had enough computing power to do two plus two in it. Maybe, I don't even know if it had a computer. It was like an old Jeep Cherokee with stick shift. It did nothing. Um, And then if you think about the amount of intelligence that exists in every single, like there are so many buttons in a modern car. The the CPU in a modern car, I'm sure, is much bigger than the one that put the uh, man on the moon. And the car, and not only that, there are sensors throughout the car that talk to the to that CPU. So when your car puts up a light, it's because there's an electronic sensor randomly hidden someplace in the tire that's telling that tire, telling the computer how much water air pressure is in that tire. And so that's essentially the same sort of thing at a much bigger scale that's happening to the electricity grid. So I assume in a, as a first pass though, if you just had a sensor that was going into the, I'll say main, forgive me if I get the details on this right, like the main wire that's going to an individual house. Mm-hmm. At some point, that's something that the grid controls and could drop a sensor on to see yeah, uh, that's back what and it, forth. That's what to we the call. House. I mean, that's really what an advanced meter is. An advanced meter. So, if you think about your electric meter as this mechanical device that counts up how many electrons you use, that's what it has always been. 
equipment. That's the thing outside your house now yeah, that you can go out. It's, it's that box big that metal you, looking thing. With you the probably never even look at, um, but that's how back in the day they used to send a meter meter out to come and look at what the number was on it. And an advanced meter is basically that thing with sensors on it and some radio ability to communicate to other machines. Um, and so that's really, I mean, the device itself hasn't changed much and sensors are so ubiquitous and so cheap that it's actually hard to argue not putting them on things at this point. I mean, you go walk into Best Buy and look at the ridiculous number, like there's a TV screen, a 30 inch TV screen in the refrigerator. How often are you sitting in front of the refrigerator that you need a 30 inch television in your, I mean, it's just like, it's crazy. They're like, oh, well, flat screens are super cheap. I'll just throw one on the refrigerator and see if people will buy it. Great. Okay. <laughs> so how many advanced meters are present throughout Rhode Island right now? None. Why? Uh, so, uh, because we're, that's, that was the process that we're starting right now. Actually, the commission is, is implementing the pro part of the proposal that we put forward as part of our power sector transformation it essentially is a rollout of advanced meters. Another reason is that actually just this year and the next two years are when our old, what we call AMR meters, which are essentially meters that are sort of advanced, but not really. They require a truck to drive by to read them as opposed to something to get out. Um, those are all coming off, not coming offline, but essentially reaching end of life. They have about an 18 year lifespan in terms of asset management. And so they need to be replaced. And rather than replacing them with dumb meters, we decided that it was probably a good idea to replace them with smart meters. Um, so the commission and the utility and the division are working together right now to formulate and finalize a plan that will start that deployment. And so in thinking about who makes the decision to do that, I got to say the org chart, yeah. if you will, for like who actually manages the utility grid is yeah. super confusing. Yeah. Can I mean, you untangle that yeah, spaghetti we'll for start us? start out at the top, which is that there's a federal agency called FERC, um, the Federal oof, Electric Reliability that doesn't sound right. We'll have to look this up and check. It's not plausible, though. Yeah, Commission, I, I, I council. I exactly what FERC stands for, to be yeah. honest with you, which is embarrassing. Um, but so FERC sets the regulatory rules for um, both the system operators at the regional level. Those are the people who are responsible for balancing the grid, the tiny wizards, the people who keep the lights on at a regional level. Um, and then they also set rules for a bunch of things that have to do with the distribution companies and how the markets work. Um, they don't have real direct intervention in rate making or any of the management of the system, unlike at the state level. Then right below that, you've got system operators. So those are the regional entities in New England. Ours is called the ISO New England, Independent System Operator New England. And their job is to make sure all the right number of plants are turned on when all the people are consuming power. So they have a big giant board that shows all the plants, all the transmission lines, um, and what the level of demand and voltage is. Um, they're, they're, the, they're the wizards. And then below the ISO are both the generators, so the people who actually run the plants, and the distribution utilities, so the people who own the copper wires through which the electrons are delivered um, and who essentially charge you for your electricity, that the utility, that's national grid, and they own the wires. So we have a disaggregated system here in New England called a restructured system where generation, transmission, and distribution are all owned by separate entities. Um, in, other, in some other states, they have vertical integration where everything's owned by one utility. And so National Grid owns the wires. Who owns the plants that are pushing the electrons into merchants. the wires? So there are all different, lots of different companies. Dominion is a company that owns uh, merchant plants. There's one called Emera here in Rhode Island. I'm trying to think who else is around here. There's lots of them. So that's, it's a different, so each, think about it as sort of like a mom and pop gas station, except sometimes you've got cartels of them. Each different plant operator sort of runs their own business and they sell their capability essentially to the market that's run by the independent system operator. That's the, the what ISO. you said ISO. Yes, That exactly. then reports to the FERC. Sort of reports. Or tries to coordinate with mm, something like that. Yeah, there, there's a hierarchy there. It's, I wouldn't say it's complicated. It's opaque. <laughs> yeah, so there's another way to think about it is that every sort of owner of a piece of the system has their own fiefdom. And to some extent, there's limited oversight over them. Their job is to keep the lights on. Um, and so the distribution utility is probably the one that has the greatest regulatory oversight. They're the ones who actually send the bills. And those are the people that we regulated when I was in Rhode Island at the state level. Um, you regulate each, each state utility generally has something like a geographic monopoly. 
So they're the only game in town in where they are. And part of the reason for that, the rationale behind that monopoly is that for a commodity that is essentially the lifeblood of modernity, the important thing is that everyone have access to it at the lowest price possible. And so that's how, why it's regulated. And this is what the Public Utility Commission did. Mm-hmm. So how do you set prices? Yeah, so the way that um, that's also changing because the old regulatory pricing system was designed for the old system in which all the, the water flowed downhill. And it gets more complicated when you've got water coming back up the hill. But the short answer is um, you try to come up with a sort of objective sense of how much the system costs to run and then incentivize a small amount above that for the company that's running it um, for them to operate it and keep the lights on. How does my bill get determined? Um, it's essentially a cost plus model. It's, it's more complicated than that. I won't get into the, the details, but the bill is, is confusing, but transparent is the way I would describe it. Um, I think a classic utility bill is a perfect example of far too much information. And so it's one of the things I think is going to start to change about the space. Uh, similarly, the way you've seen cell phone bills uh, and cell phone apps change how they, they show how, you, how much you owe. Is this a place where as a consumer you have sort of choice on any of these dimensions or are you just kind of wherever you, you live is what you got? You can decide who your like energy provider is in Rhode Island. And in Rhode Island in the restructured states in New England, they have what they call retail choice, which means that, yes, if you just walk in and start an apartment, you'll be given a national grid in a account, but you have the choice to change that from any number of direct energy providers. So the, the energy portion of your bill is basically just how much it costs to procure the actual electrons. It's not running the system. It's not uh, transmission or any of those things. It's just the pure energy portion of your bill. And there are many different providers, direct energy, um, I think NRG used to have, NRG used to have a retail business. Um, these, are the, these are the plants? No, they are actually basically commodities traders. They don't own generation at all. They trade generation. So they're between whoever owns the yes. wires and the plants. Yes. It's another layer. Yeah, they're, they play on the, at the system operator level um, and then also at the distribution level to provide the service. So the, the, the utilities are sort of like cable companies in the sense that their wires in the restructured markets, they have to allow other people to essentially use those same wires because it's a shared piece of infrastructure. Got it. So I want to think more about the future here. We can imagine ourselves in the the tinfoiled onesie suits, if that helps. You've talked a little bit about some of the changes that need to happen into the grid to make it two-way, the need for sort of more advanced meters. What what are the other things that you think need to change over the next, pick whatever time horizon you think is the right one? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the way I like to talk about it is that that if you think about the future, there are some conditions that you're relatively certain are going to be true. There will be a lot more renewable energy, and it will probably be a lot cheaper. Some make the argument that energy will potentially be pretty close to free within 15 or 20 years just because you're not paying for fuel and you're just paying volume. Um, And so that's one future condition. Another one is that there will be a ubiquitous and extremely high throughput, what I call zero latency, and I will explain that term in a little bit, um, communications network that undergirds not just the consumer world, this is what the Verizon and the and at and and the carriers are talking about, but more importantly, undergirds the infrastructure and machine internet of things so that computers can talk to computers. It will make autonomous vehicles much safer to travel and all kinds of other things. Um, and that system is going to have to look or operate a little bit like the way we have the utility system operating now, because essentially you need that throughput, that ability for information to move at uh, essentially with zero latency, with no no lag time um, in order to operate all of these future systems. And it you can never drop a call, right? If you've got two cars driving next to one another at 150 miles per hour, communicating with one another about what they're going to do, one of them can't drop a call because then people would die. And so you need 
reliability. And there are, our infrastructure systems now are designed to do that. But right now, our communications infrastructure is not yet designed to do that. So I think that will also be a change. And it will be an allowing mechanism for a whole bunch of things that it's really hard to imagine what the world will look like. But the way I like to say it is where we are in energy is sort of like where we were in cell phones in about 1995. When there'd been a lot of regulatory changes to essentially adapt to the new world. And then 10 years later, we had the iPhone, which was a catastrophic difference in communication technology and everything, right? It's not a phone anymore even. And so uh, something like that is in the offing for energy. What that version of the iPhone will be, it's it's impossible for us to tell at this point, I think. Hmm. And on the smart metering side, I mean, that's sort of one smart meter for at the household level, but there's also lots of companies pushing out meters at the individual appliance level, room yeah. level, like how far down that I mean, road it comes do you think down we need to, to go? where there's value for the consumer in my mind. Um, I think some of that's going to be up to regulators and how they decide to compensate both producers and consumers of energy in the future system where things are more complicated. Um, I also think it comes down to what people want. At the end of the day, in that future system where everything's really smart, one of the major drivers of, of value and uncertainty is human behavior. So it's so consumer-centered, which is so different from how we ran the bulk system before. It was essentially almost independent of what people did. They just thought of everything as load. But in the nimble system, the way people behave is going to be both critical to be able to predict and important to be able to shape costs. Um, and so I think that will be one of the real definers of what, what products and services are available or is really what people want. If you had to ration energy, let's say there's a outage of plants, it's, there's no wind, it's cloudy. Could the system as it's currently built actually like give each household a, a quota of energy to use? Um, no, I, not in the current form, but in the future system, you would potentially have the capability to do things like that. That is one of the things about smart metering. When you have electrons and, and photons going in two directions, you can do much more sophisticated management in that way. I find that to be extremely hard to imagine as an outcome, given the fact that at the same time, we're also, because of the price of production on a per watt basis is going down, production sources are going to be really ubiquitous. Like the smaller solar cells get and the more powerful they are, the easier they are to put on things. And so it's really, given how much energy that gigantic fusion plant in the sky is putting out, it's really hard for me to imagine like real scarcity unless you have a total civilizational collapse, which is obviously always possible. How resilient is the system? Like how often are there blackouts? Um, much less often than there used to be. Although I think they affect us a lot more than they used to. Um, and so it's interesting. There's been a, we were getting more and more used to the power never, ever going out. So when it does go out, it's, but when I was a kid, I remember the power going out with relative frequency uh, whenever there was a bad storm and you just kind of got some candles. Whereas now it's like the sky is falling when it's out for more than a day or two, which is, I mean, it just has, goes to show you how important electricity is to the modern society. And so, yeah, the system is, is, is quite reliable, it will continue to get more reliable and our expectations for it will continue to increase because at the same time as the system's getting reliable, people are getting more and more able to produce their own power. So they'll rely on the system. And one of the big challenges is that the way we pay for the whole system is essentially a socialized cost. And so as more and more people go off the grid or produce power in a way that they don't need the system, it's harder. One of the regulator's biggest challenges is how do I pay for the maintenance of this connective tissue when we only need it a smaller and smaller percentage of the time? Um, it's a really big challenge, actually, for all the regulators. So they call it Right now, they call it the value of solar is the, is the euphemism they use for it. But it's actually a much bigger and more dangerous idea than that. <laughs> so you'll sometimes hear folks talking about solar and wind being more expensive than coal and gas. There's another flavor of this I've heard before around how it's maybe not even as clean as you might think if other inputs into it have to burn things, as you said. Yeah. I mean, so how, making how of, true is all this? Um, so at the utility scale, so big solar plants and wind plants onshore wind are right now cheaper than every other type of production on a per megawatt hour. And that threshold was crossed about two or three years ago, and they continue to get cheaper again because they're not paying for fuel. 
offshore wind is not quite there yet, but it will probably be there within four or five years. Um, and uh, that's at the utility scale. We're not really close to parity at the individual, like the individual home scale. So a solar panel on your house is going to be way more expensive than it would be to you to get that same unit of power if you had your own generating plant, but you don't. Um, so, so I think that's the scale of the installation is a big driver of costs um, for those systems. In terms of the carbon intensity of their production, it depends on the technology, right? It depends on how you decide to make the steel. All of those things are, and it depends on the, you know, the actual generation source for the plant that you're building. These are all, I would say, complicated supply chain issues that are to some extent burying the lead. And I would, I would focus more on this issue of just straight up system cost and production cost. And at the end of the day, going back to our original analysis in 2003, it's really hard to beat someone who doesn't pay for fuel. Man, it seems like there's a positive feedback loop in the sense that to the extent, yes, you need power to build your yeah. solar and wind power plants, but which right now means you have to use coal, but the more of those get built, then the exactly. more you can draw on them and it helps over exactly. time. And is the cost mostly an issue of storage or is there still a frontier of more work on the capture being better? Uh, it's it's both, but... The cost of the... the Volume is really the challenge for cost. So it's production costs and installation costs that are driving your per per kilowatt um, cost for those for those installations. Um, and then, so as you produce more of them, the cheaper they get. Uh, and then I also think that so the where your supply chain is. So for offshore wind, one of the big challenges in the U.S. So your cheapest offshore wind prices in Denmark are three and a half three cents a kilowatt hour, which is just like solar and wind, way cheaper than any other type of energy that you can produce. In the US, we're three times that right now because all the supply chain is in Europe. So you gotta ship stuff a lot further um, and it costs more. And until we have enough scale here to build supply here, um, those prices are just, I mean, look, they've gone down by 80% in a five year period from our first installation to now. Um, they're dropping at very fast rates, but I think there's some structural challenges until we've got um, installed manufacturing base and assembly base here where it'll be harder for us to get down to those really, really cheap offshore wind prices for a little while. What would it take to put that kind of manufacturing capacity in place? It's already, it's already happening because it's the procurements that, have, that Rhode Island, Massachusetts, we've got one, two, point one gigawatts of offshore wind that's already been procured just by Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. New Jersey just put out their winner, which was a Rhode Island company, uh, also Deepwater Wind, formerly Deepwater Wind Orsted uh, US now, which is another 3,000 megawatts, um, which is actually, is that right? Yeah, it's another three gigawatts. Um, so the, I mean, the threshold's really about five gigawatts and we're already have that plan for the next five years. So the supply chain's already starting to move over here. In fact, I know that uh, Commerce Department and the New England Clean Energy Council are hosting an event later this month um, to talk about the New England wind supply chain uh, in Newport. Uh, there's a, the other thing for Rhode Island is basically I always say, if it floats or sinks on purpose, we make it here. It's a, it's a naval state. I mean, it has a naval history, both from a yachting point of view and from a submarine point of view. And there's a really nice affinity for that in terms of building offshore wind uh, capabilities. So just big round pieces of steel, just like the rest of everything else that goes in the water. I don't have really good intuitions for how much energy is produced by something like you know, one of the giant turbines that's yeah. out there, which I can see several from the yep. office here. They're kind of pretty, but like how many of those would we need to displace the current power um, plant sources? So, so let's see. Um, we just procured 400 megawatts here in Rhode Island. A better example. So 400 megawatts that on a very windy day, that would be a quarter of our normal demand for the state of Rhode Island, like 250,000 homes. Um, and so that's helpful. Maybe another way to think about it would be that the, the plant that didn't get built, the Burlville plant, was one gigawatt. So that would be essentially two and a half of those big giant procurements, but also it's smaller 
than the uh, what Massachusetts and New Jersey have planned in terms of their offshore. So they're building the equivalent. We're essentially now building offshore wind emplacements that are the equivalent of onshore gas power plants. Uh, turbines right now that uh, and so that 400 megawatts depending on the size of the turbine so the biggest turbines now GE's got a new set that that a new one that's 12 megawatts which just to give you a sense of how big that is it's about t almost two times as big as the ones we've got on Block Island right now those that Block Island the blades are 260 feet long and about 500 feet from tip to tip um, so the GE Halliate, I think it's called, is, is another 40-50% bigger than that. It's a, so it's bigger than a skyscraper. I mean, these are massive machines that are sublime because they are so large when you look at them. The edge of the, the, edge of the blade is moving at faster than the speed of sound when it spins because of physics. That's you can wild. hear it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, and I guess part of where I was trying to track on my intuition is to if we were totally relying on the... Um, the wind power, yeah. just almost from an aesthetic standpoint, are we talking about a world where the no. ocean front is just littered with hundreds and hundreds of these? Or? Um, so what I would say is it's hard to imagine an outcome where we have a single source. I think it's much more likely that we are, remain in an all of the above strategy. At the end of the day, if you think of the, about them all as versions of sun power, you have a bunch of solar, and when the sun's not shining, you have a bunch of storage, you have a bunch of offshore wind, but you, there, there's not likely to be an outcome in which you've ruined all the beaches with offshore wind turbines. Number one, most of the wind is far enough offshore that you can't see it. And number two, there's at least, in some cases, they're as much as a mile apart, but they're always at least a thousand feet apart, uh, sometimes 3,000 or 4,000 feet, because they're big and the ships need to be able to go between them and animals need to be able to go between them. Um, and so they're really, it's, even when you think about these gigantic wind farms, you actually can't see most of them. They're so far apart. They're so well spaced that you can't uh, offshore ones. It it just looks like, and the ocean is so big compared to anything that we put on it. It's it's actually hard to explain how inconsequential they look from far away. And it's wires that bring the electrons back to land for the most yeah, part. Yeah, underwater for the most part. It's all wires. Yeah, that's the only way to get it. And what about the solar panels on the top of a... Like if I deck the top of our house out with solar panels, yeah. how much am I really going to curb? It depends on how much you use, but you could... depend If you've got a lot of roof, you could go to close to 100% on a sunny day if you're lucky. Yeah, power, uh, panel uh, efficiency has gone up by quite a bit since I first started in 2003. Um, and sun power panels in particular are pretty powerful on a per inch basis um you do need you need some roof space so if you've got i mean the houses here in providence are not super conducive to large solar installations uh, the northern climbs because they have complicated gable roofs to shed the the snow and the rain uh, make it a little bit harder but it's definitely i would i would say you could expect 30 to 40 percent on a good day and if you're lucky and you do a lot of energy efficiency upgrades you can get up to 60 or 70 um maybe uh, but you should have a solar company come by and tell you they'll tell you yeah it also matters a lot what direction your house is facing mm -hmm. your architectural eye looking in the future you think we'll land in a place where there's solar panels on the tops of all the buildings or we've instead figured out how to just have more efficient centralized plants that are pushing the electrons back into all the houses I think the latter is unlikely. If you just look at the way that technology tends to evolve, it gets distributed in smaller. Just look what happened with phones and other things, even cars, mobility. I mean, you can make an argument that government has been doing that. That's you start out with monarchs and, and dictators uh, from Roman times and you get down to democracy. So I think it's hard to imagine a situation in which something evolves in the other direction. Um, what do you think is the most common misperception about how energy works? Hmm. I think the most common misconception is that people don't think about how energy works. Like they take it for granted. They don't understand how complicated the system is and nor, sh nor do they really need to. But especially when we start talking about things like renewable energy and how important that's going to be for our children and our children's children, it's worth understanding the, the magic of the system a little bit. Uh, and so that's one thing. The other one I would say is that, yeah, I think that they still have this, and I still have this bias because I started out in the solar industry when solar was definitely more expensive, even at utility scale. That's not true anymore. 
And there's a common misconception that utility scale onshore wind and solar in the United States is more expensive than fossil fuels or other types of fuel. It's not. This is why nuclear plants, I mean, the Millstone nuclear plant just got a huge, huge subsidy. That subsidy is not to defend them against natural gas. It's to defend them against renewables. Um, and we need the base load, and we need the carbon-free base load. So it makes sense to actually subsidize that. That's that a backup from when you can't rely yeah. on solar and wind. Yeah. The other thing that will that will start to happen is as solar as storage prices get cheaper, that will really start to increase the we call it capacity factor of these renewable technologies. That solar's capacity factor, which means that a capacity factor is basically how across a year, how much of that year is that generator going to be producing and solar's capacity factor is typically between 20 and 30 percent in the northeast offshore wind runs between 50 and 60 onshore wind depending on where you are is in between the 40s and 50s and when you then offset that with solar with storage then you can get really high capacity factors just like a natural gas plant like in the 80s or 90s or our hydro plant where 80 or 90 percent of the time you can call on that that group of units, solar and storage, to produce the generation that you want it to if you're the system operator. How do we need to be thinking about the utility grid in relation to the larger climate change discussions? Yeah, I mean, so I think the, in a way, I would argue that there's a path to a carbon-free world on the electricity side that's a lot faster than the one on the transportation side. Um, And so the way I would think about it is, A lot of the early work has already been done on electricity. We're getting to the point now where we've got price. At the end of the day, market transforms the world much faster than anything else. And now that power is cheaper to produce it that way, I think we're on a good path. I think the challenge is uh, the remaining big challenge for climate is transportation, and which is related to electricity. Right. So EVs are going to be a huge component of this. And they're already at the point where they're crossing a threshold of being a better product at a cheaper price. Electric vehicles. Yes. I'm um, sorry. EVs, electric vehicles. And I think that the relationship between the modern electric grid and the transportation system are going to be really the linchpin for addressing climate mitigation um, as we understand it in terms of actual adaptation, because honestly, like most of climate change is already definitely going to occur. Um, I think the other thing about having a distributed, a more distributed grid is that it's a technically more resilient grid. And so when you have catastrophic weather events, um, the more production locations you have that are more interconnected, the easier it will be to put things back up. When instead of having a power outage where you have to restring all the power lines, if all you have to do is get new solar panels, it's a lot cheaper and easier to restore for after massive catastrophes like the floods in, in or sorry, the uh, fires in California uh, or the floods in the Midwest, these things, which and those disasters are just going to get worse. Um, and so that's a real challenge to a centralized grid. The more resilient and distributed the grid is, the better. And this it sort of has to become that way because of the way power is getting produced going forward. You once told me that we underutilize ferries yes in the state we are a wildly under ferried state that's what you said that was one of my (laughs) sentences of the day tell tell me about our ferries well yeah i mean this is one of my kind of uh i wouldn't call it's not a peeve it's a secret passion i I love ferries and i think moving on, on water as a transit system is great for anyone who really cares about cities because it doesn't cost anything all you need is a boat and most places like rhode island the ocean state there are plenty of docks everywhere um, and so when you look at a city like Seattle or um, I'm trying to think of another good one, Amsterdam, uh, cities that similarly are situated on large bodies of water uh, or bays, the amount of water travel they have on that resource is much higher. And the quality of life of those residents that live in those places is much higher regardless of their station in life. Uh, and so one of the things, and I know actually uh, Director Alvidi at DOT shares this enthusiasm with me, and you'll know you noted may have noted in Rhode Island, at least that there's a Bristol ferry this year. So each year the ferry gets a little bit bigger that comes from uh, from Providence. You can go to Newport, you can go to Bristol, um, and we put in our proposal for Amazon HQ too, like a whole spider web of of, of ferry systems. Um, and I think that Rhode Island will get there, especially when you think about the improvement in quality of life of someone who can walk out of their house in. Bristol or Warren and be 
in downtown Providence at the I-95 district after being on a 10-minute boat ride you know, on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. I mean, that's pretty nice. Um, and so, and it's a resource that only we can do, right? Pennsylvania can't have that. I, I, I grew up in Pennsylvania. We don't have an ocean. <laughs> <laughs> There's no big bay for us to do that. Uh, and I think that's uh, thinking about the little things that only we can do is important for a little state. And what do you think it's going to take to go over the hump on that? Is it mostly a financing issue? We, yeah, it's, it's usually a money issue. I think the it's, it's always money. Um, and I think the there's federal support for some of it, but it's actually not very expensive. It's a question of prioritization. And that's always the case with pieces of policy. You know, the, one of the big challenges from government that I don't miss is uh, as much as I love having an impact on a day-to-day -day basis, is at the end of the day, it's the governor and the legislature's job to decide whether your $10, $10 million is worth more than giving some kids books or, you know, saving old lady, you know, uh, aging people. And that's a really hard balance to strike. Um, but uh, that's part of governing. If you could have, have a pick of a different government job not related to utilities, what would you do? Mayor of New York City is probably the best government job in the world. Why? Uh, you have the most ability to affect the uh, positively affect the people uh, lives of the most people, um, as in it's the most powerful executive role. Period. I mean, the city council has very little power in, uh, and so you can do so much good uh, and solve really big problems in a city that seems sometimes like the center of the world. I think it's the best job in politics, at least in the U.S. Hmm. I didn't know you're. I didn't. I wouldn't have predicted you say that. I think there'd be a lot of people who would tell you that who pay attention to politics in the U.S. Um, I mean, democracy is amazing, but it's also really challenging. And if you're thinking about it, if you really want to have impact, I actually think being the mayor of a city is of any city of any size is among the best jobs you can have. New York's just the biggest one. <laughs> so would you ever run for office? I've considered it a few times. I've got friends that have done it, obviously. I've got young kids, so it's hard to imagine uh, doing. I, I'll definitely be back in public service is one thing I'll say. If you want to announce your presidential candidate now, <laughs> like, might as well. I believe I'm literally the only person not <laughs> running for president right now. So I'm going to keep it that way. <laughs> I want to give you um, a suite of ridiculous rapid fire questions. Go ahead. Would you rather have a bunch of giant solar panels or a giant windmill in your yard? And why? Mm, solar panels. Um, they're slightly less obtrusive. And they, I also think they're kind of a little cooler because you can get the, the tracking ones that actually follow the sun like a sunflower. Uh, you, want, been, you want the panels to move around. Yeah, I just think that's kind of cool. One takeaway for me is that I do think there's value in separating residential, like the zoning matters. And a windmill is basically a giant manufacturing, it's a power plant. So you shouldn't really be putting them in the middle of urban neighborhoods on not the old ones. Now those spirally ones that you can put on top of buildings that are much smaller are much more better designed for urban neighborhoods. But those big giant ones we're putting out on the ocean, you don't, I mean, that's a power plant. That'd be like putting a, I mean, they do this. I mean, they've been destroying neighborhoods with power plants for 70 years, but um, you know, I just, I think we need to be careful about stuff like that. And environmental justice is a, a real and arguably one of the greatest axes of injustice in the United States over the last hundred years. Um, and it's a whole bunch of other things are built on top of it. But like at the end of the day, it comes down to citing bad things in places that where poor people can't get out of the way. And that's not fair. And that gets less attention in the injustice discussions than many other dimensions. It's Why do you think that is? I don't know if I want to go so deep into this because I think it's, there's a lot of race and other things built into the politics behind this. And I think it's tragic. And it's, it's, it's also sort of, some of it has to do with who's in the environmental movement and, and how that environmental movement has worked. So I think that's changing now. I mean, I'm, I'm on the board of the Union of Concerned Scientists, and this is one of the major three areas of funding and great success. We call it the Center for New Democracy. I think it's called Center. Yeah. And um, there's just so much appetite for it. So I'm excited about the future when it comes to environmental justice. Would you rather be a photon or an electron? Photon. Why? Um, I think information is cooler than electricity. Scooter or bike? Bike. Why? What kind of scooter? Uh, I'm thinking of the... A little line. Well, if it changes, the, if the it changes, your, if it changes your answer, you can... Well, no, because my thought is like you're thinking 
ride sharing, like why yeah. or jump. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would choose the the bikes rather than just because I think they're slightly less dangerous. Um, I find the scooters to, like I've almost face planted several times on one of those lime things. It is surprising how fast they can go. With I'm like really alarming and like there's no helmet. I, the helmet thing. I'm as a dad like the no helmet thing really freaks me out. Yeah, uh, I've seen a person fall in front in front yeah, of my house too. once, and yeah. it was he was not okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you get to be a dinosaur. It'll turn into fossil fuel one day. What dinosaur? Pterodactyl. Solid choice. Mm -hmm. Why? Fly. Yeah, people, I think people, I always like the T-Rex or the Triceratops too, but just from a life experience point of view, you get to, you like the only thing in the sky for like 50 million years. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, 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 what should I have asked you that I didn't even think to ask you? <sighs> um, hmm. What am I most afraid of? What are you most afraid of? It's the same thing I'm most hopeful about. I'm afraid of machines. At the end of the day, all the things that we're talking about in terms of grid operation are about interconnected communications networks with very intelligent machines that are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. And that could be good or bad, depending on which sci-fi you read. Mm-hmm. And this is one, what's, what's your, take me into your, <laughs> your dark place. Where, where, what's the version of this that you, start to have well, I mean, the troubling thoughts on. Uh, yeah, I mean, AI is terrifying. And Elon Musk was actually here, uh, I want to say two years ago during the National Governors Association, and he gave a talk and they asked him the same question. And he said, artificial intelligence, and he's right. I think we have slight disagreements on the what you should do as a result of it. Um, but I think it is a um, tiger by the tail. And there's no way to stop us from making it. It's like, it's sort of like um, nuclear technology. I mean, the cat is out of the bag. The question is, do we have the civilizational control to manage a force like that? And that was the big question in the nuclear age. The outcome of that question, to go back to our very first question, was brutalist style. It'll be interesting to see, presuming we survive this, this uh, evolutionary stage, what the architectural style of the moment is. God, it'll hate. tell us a lot. <laughs> If AI brings back brutalism waves, that's my nightmare too now. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Is, it, is the flavor of your concern there a, you know, sci-fi malicious computer comes back? Or I mean, the version that I think of is just that the complexity of software, like literally the code is so arch outstripping a person or even a team of folks ability to understand how it operates that the likelihood of errors just happening well, is increasing, increasing. And we've already, I mean, there's examples of this, of software causing vehicles to crash and things like that and taking... Yeah, but cars are, are I mean, software is already better at driving than humans are. Humans are terrible at driving. Um, the, what I would say is the thing that worries me, well, there's a whole bunch of different directions to be worried because I, I, I don't have the same concern as you. I actually think it's relatively easy to make computers better at simple skills than us. I think it make, it's hard right now for them to predict what we are going to do. So most of the crashes, uh, you have like user error in some of the crashes you're seeing, even with the very early autonomous vehicles that we have now, but most of them are because people did something stupid um, and the car didn't react to it as quickly as it should have. And the, but so the thing that there are a couple different directions of worry. Yes, one is that is a, some sort of failure, but I think more likely you have, there's malice, yes. So we're, we're complicated beings and anything that we create is likely to be relatively complicated. But also there's the one that worries me, which is just uh, the increasing inability for us to do things, right? Think about phone numbers. I still remember all the phone numbers that were important to me when I was a kid, but I don't know any new phone numbers because I've outsourced that to my phone. And there's a certain point threshold at which that all of that outsourcing becomes pretty dangerous. And actually, the movie Wally is a good example of what the dangerous version of that outcome is. Can I stoke your nightmare a little bit? No. So there's <laughs> some emergent research on how reliance on your phone's GPS. Yeah. You don't flex a part of your brain called the hippocampus as much. Which oh, yeah. Is so your sense of direction goes away. Your sense of direction starts to go away. Yeah. But the 
way our memory system seemed to evolve was the first let us manage kind of geographic navigating around, but mm-hmm. it then became the scaffolding for just our memory system in general. Mm, yeah. And so the atrophying of it, because it's not flexing the GPS, mm-hmm. might be having a cascading effect for just our memory in general. I, I would not be surprised by that. Exactly. So that's actually the thing that worries me more than anything. So now bring me to the positive light. What are you optimistic about on this front? Um, I think that the overarching outcome of this essentially computerization of things should be a democratization of access and power and value. And so the world should continue on its arc of justice, uh, if we're lucky. Mackie McCleary, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a lot of fun. Thank you for listening to 30,000 Leagues. We hope you enjoyed today's deep dive. This episode was hosted by David Yoakum and produced by Jessica Davison, Molly Cook, and Mitchell Johnson. Find more conversations on 30,000leagues.com and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Keep calm and narwhal on. I'm not a huge fan of bubble water on its own. Um, although I like the light carbonation. This is a this is the level of carbonation I can handle. Kate like she takes the whatever that machine's called and she gives like five pumps and I, just, I can't. It's like drinking a balloon. I can't take it. It's too much. Yeah, too, it's much. too much. This is nice.